Okay. Um, this is actually the first uh, meeting that we've had where it's actually been televised. So uh, for those of you who watch us on uh, television, uh, welcome. In any case, this is the uh, Local Agency Formation Commission meeting for Wednesday, July 19th, uh, 2017. Jean, would you do a roll call, please? Commissioner Arbog? Here. Commissioner Cosgrove? Here. Commissioner Draper? Here. Commissioner Garbarino? Here. Commissioner Sheridan? Here. Commissioner Slocum? Here. Chair Don Horsley? Here. Okay, item number two. Actually, we have a brand new member, Harvey Rohrbeck. So, well, you're relatively new to the city council at Half Moon Bay and formerly from the fire district on Half Moon Bay as well. Uh, that's right, Don. Um, it's really an honor to be here. Uh, glad to uh, serve in any way that I can. So Great to have you. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Harvey. So next item is a consent agenda, and there is an A through F. Uh, there are action min minutes from May 19th all the way down to some proposed annexations. Is there are any items to be taken off of consent, or is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I have a question if I have not been here at sure. previous meeting. Uh, I have to uh, recuse myself, I assume. Is that right? Uh, you, you can you can abstain from voting on this, yes. Okay. I got one question also. I, I was not here for the last meeting with, for the minutes. You, you can either abstain or you can review. If you've reviewed the, the documentation, you can you can um, vote to approve. Okay. I, I reviewed. Josh, Josh yeah, Rick? I was also not here at the last meeting, but I did review the minutes, so I, I won't need to abstain. Is that, is that appropriate? You will not need to. You don't need, to. Not need, to. need to. If you read it, you're good. Yeah. If you're okay with it. I read it. Cor correct. I'm sorry if that was confusing. <laughs> no, I just want to do that for the record. That was all. Okay, what's the pleasure of the commission? Uh, I move approval of the consent calendar um, A through F. Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, thank you. So we are now on to item number four, which is public comment for items not on the agenda. And I have one card for public comment. And uh, the subject is Peninsula Healthcare District. And I see a couple, I think a couple of members from the healthcare district uh, from, oh, I have a few more. <laughs> Okay, this one is uh, Kindy. I'm sorry, it's uh, the last name. It looks like Macamix or Mac Macamill. And then followed by Ashley McDivitt. I apologize, Chairman Worsley. If, if this is for items not on the agenda or for items, or is this with respect to Peninsula Healthcare District? Because I believe that is on the agenda. Oh, okay. In that, in that case, no, these are for item number five, so okay. I'll catch you uh, at later. Sorry. I don't usually make mistakes, but every once in a while. So item number five is a uh, continue. Okay, this is a continued from May 17th. It's the addendum report, consideration of the municipal service review, sphere update, and recommendation, but term determinations for the two uh, health care districts, Sequoia and Peninsula Health Care Districts. Martha? <clears throat> yes, thank you. Good afternoon, members of the commission, members of the public. Um, this item was uh, the schedule <clears throat> for um, producing this report slipped, and so this item's on your agenda, but the recommendation is um, for you to accept um, my report and or receive my report, receive public comment, and continue it to the September meeting to allow for adequate time for the district's and other interested parties to um, comment. And th those comments can then be also recognized at your September meeting. Um, what I did want to do is um, make some a brief um, kind of summary of the municipal final municipal service review that was the product of a draft report considered by the commission at the May 17th meeting, and then um, edited to reflect requests and comp questions from the commission, also comments and, and questions <coughs> from the um, commenting entities. Um, so the recommendation for today is to accept the report, um, and the report includes recommended draft um, municipal service review determinations with some recommended actions for the districts, um, adopt an updated inventory of active services provided by the districts as required by Government Code Section 56824, and I'll go into that. Um, 
the recommended sphere determinations and recommendation to reaffirm the transitional sphere of influence that was adopted by the commission in 2007. And there's um, discussion in the report about of what um, supporting that recommendation. And um, by continuing it to the 20th, there will be minor um, revisions to the recommended municipal service review determinations um, and inclusion of any comments. Um, it also, I'd like to um, emphasize that what is going on here in San Mateo County with the healthcare districts is going on statewide. Um, there are three different initiatives statewide. One is the Little Hoover Commission is preparing a study on healthcare districts, and that report is due out in August. Um, the uh, assembly, um, there's Assembly Bill 1728 from the local government um, committee that is looking at uh, transparency and accountability of healthcare districts. And then lastly, there is a plan in the next, uh, in the subsequent um, legislative year to do a review and rewrite of healthcare enabling legislation affecting healthcare districts. Um, just briefly reviewing some of the key points. Um, while, while the district's um, financial conditions have improved since 2000, the 2007 LAFCO review, um, the transitional nature of healthcare needs and funding has not. And the boundaries that exclude, exclude significant areas in the county have also remained the same. So those two issues um, are no different than when LAFCO considered the sphere in 2007. Um, the consultant's report pointed out, uh, made some, some key findings, um, indicating that both di districts have financial resources to meet their commitments, um, and that in the 10 years since the Municipal Service Review, the financial position of Peninsula Healthcare has improved significantly, allowing the district to both fund community health programs and to build um, uh, capital um, and dedicate that capital towards um, facility projects, including the Peninsula Wellness Community, which is in the planning process now, and an assisted living um, community, the facility. The, um, the report cites that that accumulation of uh, capital pro for pro those projects limits the funding that can be spent in the present day. So property taxes are being accumulated for the future rather than being reinvested um, in the current year. And that's an observation. Um, it does, uh, they do recommend that the district reevaluate to what extent they do that. Um, Peninsula Healthcare District does, doesn't have a formal policy um, on whether the uh, assisted living and memory care project that they are um, in the process of completing um, should be affordable to low income residents, and that's another consideration that the consultants um, recommend that the district consider. Sequoia Healthcare District's primary source of revenue is annual property tax. And they have a stated policy of returning all of their property tax back into the community outside of um, any administrative costs that they have to fund. Um, their um, one key issue for Sequoia is that they have an agreement with the Sequoia Hospital in which they're supposed to recoup $75 million that, was, that the district in, invested in the building of the new hospital. And that um, revenue has not been returning to the district as planned because of the um, finances at the hospital. And so there's a recommendation that the executive director start working more closely with the hospital to assess the financial health of the, of the hospital and whether or not there's going to be any of that revenue coming forward. Um, and then just a, a recommendation to that the county health system and um, the two districts collaborate to the extent possible to re uh, leverage resources. Um, I'd like to emphasize for the audience um, that the report is a mandated report and it is not intended to be a, 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 a devalue in any way either of the districts. It's an assessment. Um, the report documents um, considerably the uh, support, the wide support for the district's programs that are funded and the value of those programs. And then something that I believe bears um, emphasis is the, or merits emphasis, is the need to consider expanding the boundaries of the districts. The districts were formed at a time when this county was not completely built out. There are areas like East Palo Alto, East Menlo Park, 
North County areas and coastal areas that don't benefit from healthcare district programs. Um, in regard to governance alternatives, which is always a sensitive topic, um, I have in your, the report before you today um, a summary of the different governance alternatives. The dissolution of the district is um, briefly noted with the um, issue that it, be, it would be a very complex issue due to the long-term liabilities of Sequoia Health Care District and also the complex master agreement that Peninsula has with the hospital, Mills Peninsula. Um, and dissolution would require a willing successor entity. So in order to dissolve a district and have those services continue, there would need to be a successor agency that would be willing to take that on. Um, the um, dissolution of the, the other option of a dissolution is dissolution of a district where those services cease and the property tax of the two districts would just be redistributed to um, remaining entities that share territory with the district. And that um, alternative is not supported by the benefits of the, of the district programs that are identified in the report. So that's not a recommendation that I would make to the commission. Consolidation of the districts would be complex and require both political will and part of both districts. Um, and it, but it could provide savings in, in administrative and governance. And it could, um, I think, a discussion or, or analysis um, could reveal that consolidation could lead to health care policies and programs that address the broader community and with annexation, the community, the county as a whole. Expansion of district boundaries um, would require, would address the excluded areas. Um, the challenge to doing that is that in, in annexing areas, there needs to be a new revenue source. If the district's receiving a share of the property tax now within both districts within their boundaries, an annexation would require the county and the cities that would be annexed to give up some of that property tax to fund the program um, services that would be provided. Um, as I noted, I don't recommend amending the sphere that was adopted in 2007. Um, one other requirement in the law when there's a municipal service review and sphere update is that uh, the commission is required to um, adopt the inventory of active services, and this falls under government code section 56824.1. So every district has their own enabling legislation. That enabling legislation has a list or menu of all the services that district is authorized to provide. In LAFCO law, um, the, the services that are inactive are considered inactive, and the, considered, and the services that are already being provided are active. Um, in the July 19th report on page four, there's the listing from health and safety code of the services that are authorized by the district. And those that are shown in bold are those that I interpret to be the active services of the district, which are um, the power to enter into contracts with health provider groups, community service groups, independent physicians and surgeons, and independent podiatrists for the provision of healthcare services and um, the ability to provide assistance or make grants to nonprofit provider groups. And the activities of the districts, um, such as Apple Tree Dental or um, grant funding to Samaritan House fall into those two categories. All other services are inactive, and in order to activate them, they would re require coming to LAFCO with an application, a plan for service, a budget on how those would be funded. Um, and that concludes my remarks, and my recommendation, again, is to continue, take public comment, and continue it to September. Well, first, uh, do commissioners have some questions? And, any? None? OK. In that case, uh, we'll do the public comment. And I'll st start that all over again. Uh, Kendi McAmill, followed by Ashley McDivitt. Good afternoon. My name is Kendi Lee McAmel. I'm the Associate Superintendent with the San Mateo Union High School District. It's a pleasure to be here today and to share with you the impact the Peninsula Healthcare District has on the um, impact of students within our district. Um, I guess my address is uh, 650 North Delaware in San Mateo. 
Approximately seven years ago, the district convened a task force to begin rethinking the delivery of mental health services to our students. It was clear from the data that although we were spending a significant amount of resources, the outcomes provided to our students were less than desirable. Our task force made some significant inroads. However, we never quite got to the point of implementing the changes that we knew needed to be done. In January of 2016, Ashley McDevitt, on behalf of the Peninsula Healthcare District, reached out to the district and asked how they could assist us in improving the delivery of mental health services to our district students. The Peninsula Healthcare District connected us with Dr. Steve Adelsheim, director of the Stanford Center for Youth Mental Health and Wellbeing in Stanford's Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, and Dr. Shawshank Joshi, director of School Mental Health Services and the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford. Over the next six months, Dr. Adelsheim, Dr. Shawshank Joshi, and Peninsula Healthcare District worked with us to fine tune our plans to ensure that our work was based on evidence based best, best practices. They helped us to deliver, a, develop a set of metrics that would help us guide our work and measure the effectiveness of the plan and meet the needs of our students. By June of 2016, we were ready to launch our program with Peninsula Healthcare District Board of Directors approving this uh, seed money to assist us with the implementation of a school-based mental health program that would significantly change the way that our district responds to the mental health needs of our students. Can I go on? About go two? ahead. Okay. Throughout the past year, we've had the luxury of meeting bi-weekly with Peninsula Healthcare District and our Stanford partners. They've helped navigate us through HIPAA and FERPA issues, provided us with professional development and case management consultation. They have served as a conduit to a local, state, and national resources. Together, we have provided staff training and sponsored community forums and lecture series in partnership with community um, nonprofit agencies. With the support of Peninsula Healthcare District, we have also supported other local school districts. For instance, we piloted Cognito, a nationally recognized online staff development tool to provide mental health and suicide awareness. Cognito training is now a requirement for all certificated and classified staff, not only within our district, but within schools throughout the county. They have also helped with the development of HealthMaster. Could you summarize it for us? A FIPA and FERPA compliant information system. Health, um, Health Master is now being implemented throughout the county. In closing, I would like to thank the Peninsula Healthcare District and the County Board of Supervisors for making this partnership possible. They, they have truly made a difference in the uh, delivery of mental health services to the students within our district. Thank, thank you. Thank you. That's Ashley McDivitt, followed by a Bonnie, it looks like Bonnie Jew. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Horsley and Commissioners. My name is Ashley McDevitt, and I have been a member of the PHCD team for four years, currently serving as the Community Outreach Coordinator. I welcome this opportunity to speak with pride about the work being carried out by the district and the difference it is making on the health of our community. Health does not happen between four walls of a hospital. In fact, the Center for Disease Control has recently pointed out that health potential for, for adults is 20% medical care, genetics, and environment, and 80% lifestyle, physical activity, eating, healthy eating, getting enough sleep, and not engaging in risky behaviors. We recognize this paradigm shift by um, from sick focus to a health focus and the reality that health is predominantly community-based. PhD is committed to fulfilling our mandate by identifying health needs and gaps, collaborating with community partners, implementing programs, and measuring the impacts of those programs that they have on the health of our residents. We use local quantitative data sources, such as the San Mateo County Triennial Health Needs Assessment, Census Data, Pacific Islander Needs Assessments, and Youth Commission Needs Assessments, and others. We participate in a variety of community health collaboratives and committees, such as the Healthy Community Collaborative Oral Health Coalition and School Wellness Alliance. We convene stakeholders and community partners in discussion through meetings, focus groups, and town halls. Um, as you had just heard about our partnership when we were trying with this high school district, we were trying to better understand issues that are affecting teens. Um, we convened parents, county behavioral health uh, representatives, community partners such as Stanford and Star Vista, members of our faith, the faith community, and mental health experts at the variety of hospitals within our district. We're also using a new online survey tool called FlashVote, which gathers information from residents. 
This information we gather enables us to better understand the health needs and really identify specific gaps in services and programs. We develop new programs when no programs exist to address a specific health need, and we build capacity within our partners to serve more residents. Through these partnerships, we are able to... Go, just go ahead and summarize. Okay. Um, we are committed to using evidence-based practices to both implement and measure impact. Um, I thank you for this opportunity to increase public awareness about um, how districts play a, a role in the healthcare system. Yeah, thank thank you. you. And uh, Bonnie Jew, followed by Daniel Eckert. Hello. Hello. Uh -oh. Already? I'm saying. <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> okay. Well, my name is Bonnie June. I'm the dental director at Apple Tree Dental California. Uh, I've been a dentist for over 24 years, and throughout my career, I've worn many hats. Uh, as a faculty member at UOP and UCSF Dental Schools, I coordinate community programs in which I bring dental students and we provide care to underserved populations in the community. And I had also worked in my family's private dental practice until 2015 when I joined Apple Tree in San Mateo. While equally important to me, these different aspects of my career have generally existed in separate silos. Um, so you can imagine how exciting it has been for me to work in an organization uh, that incorporates all these elements of patient care about which I'm so passionate. Because Apple Tree's model is so innovative and flexible, we are able to provide quality dental care to all members of the community including those who have extreme difficulty finding other dental providers, either due to financial limitations or physical access challenges. The Peninsula Healthcare District saw this need for access to dental care and took the bold steps to bring Apple Tree Dental to San Mateo. In 2016 alone, we were able to provide dental services to 485 seniors, 1,151 children, and 1,819 adults, including hundreds of people with special needs. We also have a pediatric dental specialist who is providing dental, actively providing dental services for children with special needs, many of whom have Dentical, including providing hospital-based general anesthesia on the Mills campus in San Mateo. Currently, over half of the patients being seen at the San Mateo Center have Medica Medicaid or Dentical coverage. And in our Sonrisa Center in Half Moon Bay, approximately 75% of the patients have Dentical. What makes our center unique is that we appeal to patients from diverse social, ethic, ethnic, and economic backgrounds. Our ability to offer sliding fee scales for our patients in a beautiful facility with state-of-the-art equipment and innovative resources such as the transfer lift for patients in wheelchairs allow us to treat patients with dignity and compassion. In fact, hundreds of my patients from my former private dental practice have followed, followed us to San Mateo and traveled to San Mateo from San Francisco and around the Bay Area because they appreciate Apple Tree's mission and they want to support such a worthy program. I am proud to be part of Apple Tree Dental California, which has impacted the lives of thousands of community members in San Mateo County, as well as the larger Bay Area. And I am so grateful to organizations such as the Peninsula Healthcare District and the Sequoia Healthcare District, who support programs like ours that provide critical services to its constituents. Thank you. Thank you. And Daniel Eckert. I'm sure you won't. Uh, you don't know me that well. <laughs> Pool in a china shop. Okay. That's all right. I got a loud mouth. It, it'll, it'll actually, it'll pick, it'll, work. it'll pick it up where you're at. Thank you. I'm here to speak on behalf. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, that was quick. You got rid of me early. I'm here to speak on how fortunate we are to have such a quality, dynamic dental service such as Apple Tree. And I'm here to thank the county and the health care district for supporting them. I hope the county continues their support for Apple Tree Dental. Apple Tree has a robust on-site care program with specially trained staff to provide preventive care and treatment to more than 30,000 patients throughout the country each year. They're nationally recognized for their pioneering approach to integrating dental care, and as part of overall health and well-being, they're proud to serve everyone. With two centers here in San Mateo County, 
They provide preventive care for and treatment for more than 2,000 patients in San Mateo County. Apple Tree Dental is here in San Mateo County to improve the oral health of all citizens, including those with special access needs who face barriers to care. Apple Tree works very hard to achieve its mission by delivering quality dental services to the vulnerable populations. Patients with special needs, physical, medical, development, cognitive conditions, and other special requirements when seeking dental care, they are there to provide it for them. Caring for special needs takes special compassion, understanding, and awful, often special equipment that most dentist's offices, and I can attest to that, will not, they don't have any special equipment for us to transfer from point A to point B. Apple Tree staff has special training to meet those unique needs to their patients and family. I was fortunate enough to find out about Apple Tree when I was up at the College of San Mateo and saw their mobile dental service at the college one day, and I asked a friend about it, and he said he just got an exam for $10, which led to an appointment, and it fixed his filling for him, and he got a 30% discount being a student. I found that quite fascinating. So I investigated looking for dental work, and uh, I found out they actually had some special equipment to transfer me from the chair to the dental chair, and I don't believe in this county or Northern California there's many dental offices that can do that. And uh, that really turned my life around. I actually look forward to going to the dentist again, if that's a possibility. But in closing, I'd like to, uh, in closing, it's very important that we support Apple Tree's nonprofit model, which leverages community resources to accomplish its missions. They have developed and continue to invest in the world's finest dental equipment and patient amenities. And their multilingual, high-trained staff is experienced in all aspects of dental care, be it geriatric, pediatric, and special care expertise at their centers. I urge you supervisors and the health district to please support Apple Tree Dental as they are a great asset to our community. And we should all be very proud to have them as part of our San Mateo County dental work. Thank you, folks. Thanks, Mr. Eckert. You're Eckert. Okay. Ann? I, I end up having a question. Um, is there an entity within the county that looks at um, health care as a whole and looks at the, the needs and the capacity to serve? And the reason I ask that is, as we all know, health care and the funding of health care is being discussed at the federal level. And I've tried very hard to read about it and learn about it. And one of the things that I hear is significant potential, significant reductions in uh, federal funding, which would then go through the state. And in, in some analyses, not necessarily for San Mateo County, they talk about how hospitals would have to close, services would have to stop if they were implemented. And so it just sort of made me think, as I was hearing uh, the speakers talk about federal funding or federal funding coming through the state, um, if there's any entity that is charged with or has taken on uh, the analysis of health care needs throughout the whole county and then the funds to carry those out. Um, Supervisor Horsley and the health care districts may have um, comments to add, but the county's health system is does look at health needs countywide and I believe is looking at the impact of, of what may happen with the Affordable Care Act changes, potential changes. Um, there's also a study that's done uh, annually or biannually that's a health needs assessment for San Mateo County. And in that, um, that's something that the districts rely on and the county relies on, on in determining some of their programs. And actually that um, assessment also um, identifies these districts and the county as um, important assets for health care. Uh, Commissioner Draper, I might just add a couple things because I am on the, it's the health plan of San Mateo. And it basically, it, um, it's, a, it's our entity that we've created to um, provide health care for uh, both indigent folks and people who are on Medi-Cal, which is essentially generally for low-income uh, people in the county. We have about 150,000 people in that system. And... Um, 
so we have, uh, and obviously the county has a hospital and there are 12 clinics and we work closely with uh, all of the hospitals. The only hospital that our health plan does not have a contract with is actually Dignity. We do have one with, uh, with uh, Sutter and with uh, Seton. And, uh, and we also have, uh, obviously for mental health and for substance abuse, our uh, behavior health and recovery system actually uh, provides those kinds of services as well. So yeah, we do have a really, I think in this county, we're pretty fortunate uh, in that we have a very robust system. Uh, for people who are not covered by Medi-Cal or Medicare or private insurance who have essentially, who are not eligible, for example, they may not be eligible because of immigration status, they have another program called ACE, which is Access and Care for All. So there's essentially no reason for anybody in this county to be without some kind of health coverage. And we have a, a very robust network of primary care physicians and contracts with uh, specialists as well. So uh, whatever your um, uh, you know, uh, illness uh, is, uh, we somehow manage to take care of it. And the healthcare districts actually provide somewhat of a safety net as well um, in a somewhat different way. It depends on the, the particular programs for the individual uh, healthcare districts. But you know, I think overall we do uh, in this county have a, a pretty robust system. And we, at the same time, we're worried about what the federal government may or may not do. Uh, it looks like the, uh, the alleged, it's kind of a funny, so a funny name, they called it Better Health Care for All, which is actually was worse, um, but uh, it should have been the worst health care, health care for all. But, you know, we do, you know, we do, we were, we've sort of anticipate, well, tried to anticipate, if that happens, what would we do? And, um uh, you know, I could just say that we, we do, we have set aside funds in an event that we did lose significant Medi-Cal expansion fun, funds that we could continue with that program for some period of time. Now, how long we could continue with that is, um, you, know, you have, just don't have those kinds of projections. But for the most part, I think the county, I think, does an outstanding job. And I think the healthcare districts uh, really supplement that. Any other commissioner questions? Not, I just, uh, I, um, Helen Galligan is here. I don't know if you want to speak. You don't have to, but if, if you want to say anything or, uh, uh, you have another commissioner there as well. Either one, um, if you wanted to, you can have as much time as you'd like. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Dennis Zell. I am a elected director of the uh, Peninsula Healthcare District. Um, uh, I uh, just wanted to make a, a, a few points about where healthcare districts fit into the o overall scheme of things because that's a question the legislature is looking at right now and it's certainly a question uh, that's uh, addressed in, in the report. Um, the, the way to think about healthcare districts uh, from my perspective is uh, that we're a, we're a gap filling uh, entity. The county, with its uh, 2.7 or so billion dollar uh, budget, uh, is charged with uh, indigent care. It gets the grants from the federal government or the state and, and, and uh, provides for in indigent care. In our county, we're also fortunate to have a robust uh, private industry. We have uh, hospitals that, uh, and private doctors who uh, provide services on the private market. Uh, uh, we're fortunate that uh, we have a, a high level of uh, people who are insured in this county. Um, uh, our, our budget for the Peninsula Healthcare District is six million with an M uh, dollars a year. Or that's the tax revenue we receive from property taxes. Um, Healthcare districts are a creature of statute, and their scope and authority is limited by statute. Healthcare districts can be innovative and are expressly authorized to, quote, finance experiments with methods of providing adequate health care. That's California Health and Safety Code section uh, 32126.5AC. Uh, However, unlike counties, all of our programs and projects must be self sustaining. That's California Health and Safety Code 32,125, uh, which, which states a, a district shall not contract 
to care for indigent county patients at below the cost of care. In setting the rates, the board shall, insofar as possible, establish rates as will permit the district healthcare facilities to be operated upon a self-supporting basis. And, and so what, what that means is uh, um, that there's a, what, to address uh, your, your question, uh, um, there, there's a health needs assessment. This is a regional report that's done about every three years. Hospitals are, are uh, invited, uh, the government, the, the county is invited, county officials, um, uh, uh, physicians, and they assess uh, what services are being provided in the region and uh, what what how the outcomes are what what are the areas are improvement and so that document um, is is an important document it is the document that uh, our, our our ceo sits on that board uh, it we we it projects not only that which exists but problems that uh, will occur so for instance a few years back there was an issue with the aging population in this county this is the because of the baby boom, this is going to be one of the oldest uh, counties, and so that has that demographic fact has uh, health significance to to the delivery of, of health care, and so that's when we started this uh, what, what we call the uh, uh, the um, the Truesdale. This is our memory care facility. Um, our projections showed that the county was going to be. Uh, short of memory care facilities. So before that demogra uh, demographic bubble hit, we, we started planning and building. The same uh, with our uh, Peninsula Wellness uh, community. It's going to provide assisted li living. Uh, 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 we're, we're, we're working with like Mission Hospice. We're, it, it's going to be this idea of aging in, in place so that um, uh, instead of having a shut, uh, shut in up in their uh, 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 house in the hills, they can uh, sell or rent that out, come to a facility where they can uh, get older with uh, others and have all the services they're needed so that they don't have to, to leave their uh, community. Um, According to the University of Wisconsin Robert Woods Johnson 2017 survey, which is kind of the survey in evaluating uh, uh, health outcomes and uh, factors, and by factors they mean access, San Mateo County was uh, number one in outcomes and number two in access for all of the state of California. So the, the combination of, uh, uh, of a county who's uh, really innovative and in, in tune with taking care of the indigent care, coming up with creative solutions with the, uh, the ACE program uh, uh, that the supervisor uh, mentioned, and uh, um, the, the children's insurance uh, program, uh, those are innovative programs. Now, when the economy dipped in the Great Recession, uh, the, you know, those extra programs, uh, the county had trouble funding. The uh, Peninsula Healthcare District stepped up, and we spent $4.6 million up until last year on uh, providing access to care for the adults. And uh, during that same recession period, we paid between $1.3 and $1.5 million uh, a year toward the uh, insurance for the, the, the kids. And although, um, you know, compared to the billions uh, in the budget for the county, those numbers might seem uh, modest, uh, with our uh, $6 million a year budget, it, it was a substantial investment and one we were proud to make. Uh, so that's when Supervisor Horsley talks about the uh, social safety net. You know, that's not really our ballywick, but... Um, we are authorized by statute to pay for uh, some insurance, and when, uh, when the need is there, we, we step up. So uh, what, what we're doing with Appletree and others is we, we, we find a gap where the private sector is not quite doing it. It's not within the realm of the indigent care, and, and we try to introduce a, a creative, uh, innovative system that will be self-sustaining. Um, we, we heard earlier the, the um, 
uh, high school district, that was, we noticed, uh, I noticed a rise in suicides in Palo Alto. How can we uh, stop that uh, phenomenon from occurring in San Mateo County? Uh, we uh, called up Ashley, Ashley called up Stanford University and, and the district, we got uh, everybody together, and then within six months we had implemented a, a program which the high school district uh, in Stanford were uh, both supportive of and which had, had just been lacking funding, and now the, the high school district's gonna continue that. So that those are the kinds of things we do. I, I probably spoke longer than I should have, but, but I appreciate uh, the opportunity. And right. Thank you very much. Any, any questions from commissioners? Uh, any comments? I'll just reiterate the two comments that I made uh, about from the Peninsula Healthcare District and also Sequoia. I would like to see an expansion. In fact, that's in the report, an expansion of the boundaries. I know that's, uh, you know, it, it would have to work with cities and the county as well, but uh, especially in the Sequoia Healthcare District because East Palo Alto is an area where there's significant health needs. And so I would like to see the, uh, the districts work on an expansion of the boundaries and of course, uh, Sequoia probably really needs to be looking at uh, the hospital and whatever happened to the revenue stream that they had an anticipated in the past. Uh, and the last comment I had uh, going back to Peninsula Healthcare District really had to do with your memory care is, uh, is, is finding some way to at least take some low income folks as well as uh, your uh, regular clients. So, because those are my two comments. Uh, Commissioner Rohrbeck. Um, the Coast Side really does have a, a significant need for medical care. There's a large uh, population that uh, is not totally indigent, but certainly can't afford private uh, care. And it's something worth uh, thinking about. We, the only emergency um, services available are um, very expensive, the Seton Coast Side. And uh, anything that can be done to help the uh, health care outcomes on the coast side would be greatly appreciated one way or another. Thanks. And uh, I think actually the district closest to the coast side, probably Sequoia. And in fact, uh, so your uh, son Reese's is, uh, is on the south coast, but I, I actually think the Half Moon Bay and the south coast is probably closest to Sequoia health care district. So we will make that comment to them at a later point. We don't need to take, make a motion on this, correct? This is just basically information. Okay, thanks for your comments, I appreciate that, and for the folks who had public comment on this item as well. So we'll now go on to item number six, an application received and not certified as complete. It's another information only. Correct, nothing to add. No, nothing to add, okay. So we don't need to do anything with that one. Uh, so number seven, the appointment of a legislative policy committee member. Yes, um, it, there was a misunderstanding at the last LAFCO meeting and um, we had someone volunteer for a committee that was already on that committee. Oh. Um, so I'm requesting today that we get a legislative com policy committee member um, volunteered or appointed by the commission. The current members are Ann Draper and Mike O'Neill. Is there someone willing to serve on that committee? What is, what is the, uh, what, what's the time commitment? That's be my question. So the, the, the legislative part of it is meeting um, prior to LAFCO meetings in, to look at the pending legislation and make recommendations to the commission on positions. Um, there's also intermittent emails that will go out because the legislative committee is authorized by the commission to send letters with positions if it's something that is, um, needs to be expedited and there's not time to put it before the commission. Um, and then the policy part of it hasn't yet started, but it's about looking at the existing policy, reviewing existing policies of the commission and, and updating them. Um, I would imagine it can be anywhere from once a month to twice a month if we get real busy. And we could also conference call. Are you willing to serve? No, I was just, I, I would oh. yield to uh, uh, Supervisor Slocum if he was interested in doing it at uh, my schedule. I'm sure he's busier than I am, though. But, um, 
you know, I mean, if you need someone to be on it, I would not mind doing that if Supervisor okay. Slocum no, does not you, want to do is it. There, <laughs> is there a through, the, through the chair. Yes. Um, you know, what we tried to do with the committee membership is make sure that the different types of membership are represented in these in these committees. And if it's the pleasure of the commission that they have a two-member committee for policy and legislation, that would also be fine. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure what you, so we don't need to make a motion to don't need to appoint somebody. The intent was to give the different types of members, county, city, special district opportunities to be on the on these committees so that their perspective is represented. If there is no one willing, uh, the committee could still operate. I, it sounds like uh, you're, you're willing. Uh, I'd be willing to do the legislative okay, policy so committee. Is there a uh, we'll try it and see how schedule-wise. I'm making wise. a motion. <laughs> yeah, so, so, <laughs> so wait a minute. With my okay, backup so, right here. So there's a motion to appoint Commissioner second Joe Sheridan. Ahead, second by Commissioner Cosgrove. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any, uh, any opposition? Aye. No. Aye. It, it passed. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, now we are on to the legislative report. Yes, you have a report dated July 12th that um, summarizes three bills that are currently being fo uh, followed by and proposed actually and supported by CalAFCO. Um, the bill that is AB 464, this commission's um, legislative committee authorized a letter of support and that um, was actually, that bill was signed by the governor and that affects um, the ability of or the um, process and policies regarding annexing lands that are already receiving service under um, contract and already approved by LAFCO. Um, I don't have anything else to add to the legislative report. It does give you information about the activities of the Little Hoover Commission and the plans for um, a review of health care district enabling legislation. Um, and then just one point of clarification, um, and I think I miss, misspoke to um, Commissioner Draper. The um, SB 448, which would fit, um, streamline the ability to dissolve districts that are inactive, um, the um, idle districts are defined as districts that by their enabling legislation can receive revenues to provide programs and they may have years where they don't receive those revenues and therefore they're idle. And so those districts were removed in order to not um, compromise a district that has a good, it could be like a resource conservation district, for example, that doesn't receive property tax, but every couple of years might receive a grant to do work. And so that, that was all I wanted to clarify. And there's no action. This is information only. My question was on, uh, thank you, was on page one, was inactive versus idle. I didn't know what the difference was. So um, thanks for that. I also wanted to let the uh, commission know that I had requested and staff has done it, uh, is that whenever this LAFCO writes a letter to a state elected official that we CC our local state elected official. So. They, they know what we're doing and hopefully we'll um, uh, take that into consideration as they have conversations and actions with their, um, within their bodies. So thank you very much to staff for adding that. Okay, uh, going to the next item with the annual conferences in October 25th through 27th. Um, did you wanna make a comment about that? Do we? Yes, just yes. to clarify that the commission's budget budgets for one staff member and one um, commissioner from each category of membership to attend the conference. Um, the I've already the commission actually registers the um, participants, and the hotel room and travel is something that is paid for by the participant and then reimbursed after the conference by LAFCO. So there's, there's going to be somebody from the city representing cities and somebody from special districts and then one member from either the Board of Supervisors. And a public member. And a public member. So uh, that, so that if you're interested, you should contact uh, Martha? Yes, please. Okay. Next is uh, 
nominations for 2017 2018 board members that's the rotation for our chair no excuse me this is for the california association oh. of lafco's board members and there's a mistake in the memo it's actually the cal lafco that is is divided into four regions and we are in the coastal region um, there are actually vacancies coming up for um, city member and special district member in the coastal region and the nominations are due by September 25th, so there would be time for this to be considered at the September meeting as well if either the city members or a special district member would like to be nominated by this LAFCO or both to be nominated by this LAFCO to um, run to be on the state board. Um, membership or participation on the state board would require um, additional funds in the budget because that requires attendance at board meetings and they're usually held in Southern California, alternating with Sacramento. Any interest? Okay. Yeah, I'm on the uh, legislative committee here. <laughs> <laughs> You're taken out there, okay. Your time is all uh, used up. Okay, so I don't hear any uh, nominations, so we'll go on. The Achievement Award nominations, is that, do we have, um, no? Nothing to nominate, no achievements, okay. Uh, item number 10 is Special District Risk Management Authority. That's yes. another election. And, and this is voluntary on the part of the commission. I wanted to give you the opportunity. So the, the commission receives, um, is insured by the Special Districts Risk Management Authority, which is part of the California Special Districts okay. Association. And they have a board and they have elections and we, this commission is authorized to vote if you would like to cast a vote for any candidate. Okay. Uh, Joe, would you like to be on this? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's already nominations. So okay. I, I'm you. not, anybody interested in serving on this? So, so this is actually, there's a ballot and there are, are people that are running and it's whether or not this commission wants to vote oh, for one of those candidates. Do we know who they are? Oh. I have no idea who this person is. Um, do we individually, do we, in other words, take a motion, do we decide on, as a group to vote on one or? Yes, and so I, I would rely on the special district members as to whether or not, and I'm not to, not to put any pressure on you, but it's, it's difficult when you have a statewide association and you get candidate statements from people in districts in other counties that, you know, whether or not you're making a wise decision on, on voting for them is, I can't advise you on. I'm happy to say that I do not know any of these individuals in here. Um, and I've always kind of had a rule of thumb when I don't know the individual and they haven't reached out to me and asked, you know, for my vote that uh, I just declined to vote. Um, okay. That's been my policy. Maybe I should ask Seppi Richardson if she knows any of them. I guess not, no. I noticed you were hobbling around. I hope you didn't break your ankle. Ooh, sorry to hear that. In that case, we'll pass on to the next thing. And obviously there's no, we're not going to make a decision on that. Commissioner or staff reports? Uh, nothing. Any commission reports? Uh, there being none, we'll then adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. Good job.